Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, uh, webinar today where we're, we're going to introduce the um, MISD Mastering IT Support Delivery Aspiring Manager course. Um, I'm uh, delighted to have with me today Noel Bruton, who happens to be the, the lead author for the uh, uh, mastering IT support delivery uh, full curriculum. Um, he's developed this uh, this particular course, and he'll be um, hosting most of the the session today as we as we go through um, the content and give you an introduction to um, the, uh, the, the 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 course content and the the, the intended audience and and the reasons why you or your colleagues should perhaps be uh, be looking at, uh, at this as a as a as a qualification scheme. Um, so my job's uh, relatively light in terms of just giving you introductions. Um, just a few bits and pieces. If I can ask that you do keep your microphones and cameras switched off throughout the duration of the session, then it means that uh, we can be focused on just those who, who are speaking. So that would be great. Um, I am actually recording the session um, and it will be uh, made available on our YouTube channel um, and uh, we will also uh, send it out to you the, the link to the uh, to the session uh, through to you all via email after this event so if you have got colleagues who uh, haven't been able to attend who are interested and of course they've got the opportunity to uh, to observe the the, the recording as well um, I'll equally be be sending out in that email uh, copies of the, the slides if, if that's of, of any use to, to anybody so uh, uh, you can uh, have, have both of those things and and uh, have a look at the content as we as we move forward um, Noel and my contact details are there up on the on the screen there, so you'll you'll have access to those. So feel free to to contact us with with any questions after the event. But uh, we will have uh, some time towards the end of the session to, uh, to to give you the opportunity to ask answer ask any questions that you may have overall about uh, uh, about the qualification scheme or the the aspiring manager course itself. So. Um, very briefly, so this is a, a SysOp event, so thank you all for signing up and, and, and joining the event today. Um, SysOp are a, a, an IT best practice training consultancy organisation and have been operating in this space for, for a long, long time. Um, so we do all things like ITIL training and Service Desk Institute and, and all things related to um, IT support, IT delivery, service management as a whole. Um, as well as a few other areas that um, that are sort of support of, of those areas. Um, we've been doing this for a long time. A testimony uh, to our success really is the customer feedback that we get um, about our exceptional customer service and uh, the fact that we we tend to to, to want to focus on the practical side of things. We recognise that a lot of qualifications um, come with an examination and of course uh, participants will want to go through and, and successfully pass the uh, exam. But from our point of view, we want to make sure that um, that the information is well understood, um, relatable and, uh, and can actually be practically applied back in the organisation. Um, so that's really the focus of, 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 of uh, all of our products and services. Um, that's me on the screen there. So to give a bit of information, I'm our ITIL4 product lead, varied IT experience, um, but I'm not going to go on about me too much because I think that uh, Noel uh, will be doing introductions to himself shortly, um, more about uh, the, this particular session and, and what he's looking to do. Um, so this is a Mastering IT Support Delivery webinar, but the focus today is on the Aspiring Manager course. So once I get through these uh, the welcomes and introductions, um, I'm going to hand across to Noel, who's going to take us through uh, why the Mastering IT Support Delivery curriculum is, is different, the qualification scheme itself, and then we'll start to focus on the Aspiring Manager course, which is, uh, as I say, the, the, the main topic of, of discussion today. Uh, we've got quite a lot to cram into the hour, so I'm just going to uh, hand across to, to Noel now to, to pick up on, on this. But we will um, talk about what's next and, and have a, an opportunity for you guys to ask questions. Um, we have the chat facility here, although your microphones are switched off. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you do have any questions as we go along, then please do feel free to to stick them into the chat as we go. And I'll make sure that uh, in the end, we, uh, we if we don't address those questions as we go, that we we pick up with them at the end, end of the session overall. OK, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, um, allow Noel to uh, to connect on and, uh, and and share his screen. So just uh, give us a few seconds to to sort that out. 
There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Noel. Um, and we can see you, Noel. And if you can just uh, unmute your microphone. All right, all right. Yeah, brilliant. OK, I'll hand across to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, a few bits and pieces. I've got to get an awful lot through here. But the first thing I want to say is that Mastering IT Support Delivery has now been adopted by a Vixer. Has now been adopted by a Vixer as um as their service management curriculum, and I'm quite proud of that because I mean, well, you can imagine there are other service management curriculums knocking about, um, not in, not not just ITIL. So uh, we're we're quite proud of that achievement. Um, let's uh, next slide. Uh, I'm only saying that because it should it should actually move to the next slide, but it isn't. Oh, I have a say. Okay, why is MISD different? Uh, because it's uh, let's go straight to the, straight to the following after um, the one after this because I'm going to be uh... okay. I've been in IT for 40 years. You wouldn't think so, given my ham-fistedness with, um, with PowerPoint here. And I've been consulting for about 30 years. And my job, typically, is I go into organizations or I'm invited into organizations to help them improve their IT support. And that happens. It has to be deeply, deeply practical. I've written lots and lots of books about IT support management and, um, and they're kind of uh, best-selling and, and used for uh, university courses and so on. Which, um, as for mastering IT support delivery, um, I well, I've been writing courses about support management since 1992, and um, this one was I had I wanted to make the definitive um, curriculum about about managing IT support. Um, seriously, how do you do your job? Not how do you run your processes or how do you how do you adhere to a certain process environment, but how do you do your job? How do you motivate your staff? How do you figure out how much workforce you need? How do you figure out how many people should be on the on the on the service desk? How do you figure out what kind of skill sets your second line should have? And what's the difference between a process and a procedure? All this real stuff that people have to do in order to get um, in order to get through the, the the kind of the the work of having to deliver IT support. Um, it's deeply, deeply practical. It's all the way. It's not generic process. It's work group specific, getting the best out of your people and making sure they can get the best out of you, by the way. It does work both ways. Um, this is the, the curriculum, the way it's laid out. Uh, the ones that, um, that are, are currently available are aspiring manager and operational manager. In other words, operational manager, um, big, complicated, um, strictly, strictly how to... Um, course on for any uh, head of a technical work group and the aspiring manager is for technicians being promoted to manager which is not always that straightforward um the aspiring manager um if you, you've got a technician you need to bring him on to or bring her on in, in order that they can they can run a work group rather than just be another part of it um what aspiring manager contains is is information specifically to help those promoted to make that mental leap, and I want to have a look in the mental leap, uh, at the mental leap in a bit more depth. Um, there's all. I also have a, a big to-do list. In other words, what it started at a university in the West Midlands, and um, I went in to see them, and uh, to, they asked me to fix their IT support. And um, one of the things we found out that was wrong was. There was a manager of all the second line support technicians and his staff absolutely loathed him. He couldn't manage his way out of a paper bag. Essentially, all he'd done is been promoted from being a technician into a, in, into a management role, which he'd accepted happily because it meant more money. And they'd, and they'd given him that management role in order to keep him because the only way to, to increase his salary was to, was to put him into another role. And now they put him into a management role and he just didn't have a clue what management actually meant. And I felt sorry for him because I've seen that so often technicians promoted into management roles who then don't know what the management job actually is. They don't even know how to think about it. And so I wrote the aspiring manager course and um, though I say it myself, there is genuinely nothing else like this. 
Um, Help Desk Institute don't have anything like this. SDI don't have anything like this. Microsoft don't have anything like this. Certainly, ITIL don't even look at these concepts. So, um, uh, so I, I, I wrote this in order to solve specifically that problem. Um, again, um, it's don't think of this as an alternative to ITIL. It's not. It can either exist in an ITIL organization or outside of our ITIL altogether, or it can or it can completely collaborate with ITIL because what it's about is how technicians and managers in a, in technical work groups do their job. It's not about um, uh, what is incident management or anything like that. It's a, com uh, a completely different view. It's it's the practicality of doing their job, and uh, and it also is designed with a view to be. Uh, usable in external support organizations as well. So not, not just internal support where the, 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 the service desk and the technicians uh, are um, uh, hired by the same organization uh, that, uh, that hires the users. It's uh, when, those, when all that stuff is outsourced. MISD is scalable from two support staff to any number. Where you've got an operative and a senior, you can use MISD. And it's about this technician brain to manager brain thing that's the that's the big one um and does your head of tech of, of an it technical work group by the way any work group any work group where support is involved doesn't just have to be the service desk doesn't just have to be desktop support it can be epos it can be um it, uh, it can be well in uh, in a number of cases it's um I, i've got it running in hospitals as well it, it can be anywhere where there's a technical a, t a technical work group um uh, that provides that is involved in providing uh, technical solutions so for example even development to certain to under certain circumstances uh, may be called upon to provide te tech support so it even works there um and it's about this difference of at least aspiring managers about the difference between the technician brain or the management brain and it's it's because of the nature of it i mean the thing about it is it needs technicians to be able to function uh, network engineers developers desktop support that's the thing yeah in order to be able to do its job it has to hire or develop technicians well, what if you only hire technicians? What are the implications further down the line if you only hire technicians? Um, for example, what if your CIO still cuts code? Even IT needs managers to take take charge of the work group. And I mean, taking charge of the work group is, uh, uh, if I promote somebody to run a work group, I expect that person to look at that work group and see, right, how can I improve it? How can I make it more efficient? How can I make sure that it always does what it's supposed to be doing? How do I know that that's the right thing that it should be doing? So in other words, there's something involved in running a work group to improve the performance or develop the staff. But if your talent pool consists only of technicians, you have to promote from within technicians. And all too often, technicians don't make the, men the philosophical leap between them thinking like a manager and thinking like a technician. And it's a big difference. So first you've got the authority gap. Uh, um, take for example, the technician's job. Um, he has a, um, the technician has a job description and has, um, oh, I know a connection to the ITSM system and, um, and requests come in or project commissions come in and things that this person has to react to. And, when, and, re, and in other words, they're responding to requests and they work largely alone on a, um, on a diagnostic basis. I'll come back to that one. In other words, they're doing what they're told, but a manager is not necessarily doing what they're told. A manager has to decide what needs to be done and then put an organization in place that can do it. So, it's, uh, I mean, uh, um, a technician might be dealing with one technical problem every half an hour or so, and the manager is dealing with 400 technical problems every month. And it has to build a machine to be able to do that. Requires a completely different approach. So um, we'll look at, um, uh, take for example, the hierarchy. I want, I want, to, I want to illustrate this because it's, there's a peculiarity here and sometimes gets in the way of, uh, of, of, of new managers. An instigator starts an organization and, in, and, and that, that organization starts to become successful. And because it becomes successful, the instigator realizes that he or she has to 
uh, to to expand operations. So he um, he appoints a business admin person. He appoints a, a, somebody to deputise for himself. He appoints a head of sales, and the head of sales appoints a sales force and a marketing force, and so on. But this these second line appointments, this instigator is not an idiot. When he hires this business administrator, he must necessarily hire somebody who's a qualified and capable business administrator who will know more about business administration than the instigator does. That's the that's the whole point. Every every rank is promoting somebody below them who has a higher level of specialized expertise. So you go through the business administrator will 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 hire somebody to look after business support, somebody to look after facilities, HR premises and so on. And the business support person will necessarily be a more specialized and more knowledgeable in that specific field than the business administrator will be. And so it goes down till eventually the um, the business support realizes we need somebody in charge of IT. IT manager realizes we need somebody in charge of development and somebody in charge of production. Production decides that we need somebody in charge of infrastructure, service, desk, desktop support, AV support, and then desktop support, the set desktop support team leader decides that we need somebody who's, say, an expert in Excel. Okay. And all the way down, somebody is writing a job description for somebody that they are going to hire where that person will know more about what needs to be done than the job description can ever describe. So in other words, that person on, on the lower rank is a greater specialist. It will have to be. That's the reason they were appointed. So now, what? where does power lie when you've got that situation going on? I mean, take our Excel expert right at the bottom of the stack, just one, one level below the, uh, above the cat. Now, who has more authority in how spreadsheet benefits this company? The CEO, who has the ultimate authority, or this Excel chappy, um, who's, who knows more about Excel than everybody else in the organization? Now, all of a sudden, that puts a completely different twist on power. And it puts a completely different twist on power all the way through the hierarchy. In other words, all these managers that you see, uh, see above, they're all in charge of their own departments. And they're all doing more or less the same job. They're running their own departments, which puts them more on a par with one another than it actually demonstrates a way of distributing a way of distributing power. We've always been taught that hierarchies are ways of distributing power, but it isn't actually true. It's not a power pyramid. It's a market for authority. It's a way of distributing authority, which means that any manager is essentially doing the same job as every other manager. So you don't have to have your job conferred upon you. You don't have to your, have your authority conferred upon you. You look at your department and you decide what needs to be done. And that mean that may mean that you have to link up with other, other departments as well. Authority is not conferred. It's assumed. And an awful lot of people being promoted from technician to manager don't realize that. They have to wait for their boss to give them instructions. They don't actually take, take control of their own jobs. Second is in the nature of the work. And for the nature of the work, I'm going to I'm going to go to camera. I'm going to stop sharing for, for a moment. One second. All right, where's my mouse? I've got a tiny little mouse, two millimeters across on the 65 inch screen. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing because it's easier to illustrate this this way. This is um, let's say this is this is an object that I have to support. This object is finite it's in production so in other words all its parameters are already decided somebody's designed those in now then when something goes wrong with this or i have to install it or, or, or uh, and so and so on um as a technician what i have to know about is all the various built-in parameters that already exist within this object and know how much to adjust each of those parameters this way or that and and in what um, and, and in what combination to, to adjust them in order to get the device to do exactly what I want it to do or to, or to restore it to working to a working state or to install it, for example. That's what technicians do. In other words, the technician is dealing with a, an object that's already predefined and it's this close. That's the nature of diagnosis. Managers don't have the luxury of diagnosis because they're not dealing with um, with with one simple predefined uh, object they're dealing with a 
um, with a, a set of situations, some of which were, may even be political. I'm, I'm taking, I've, 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 my slides reappeared on every on everybody's screen now. Somebody say, yeah. Yes, yep. they have. Oh, yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, so the the nature of the work is hugely different with, with technical work, predefined systems, as opposed to situations and circumstances. Technical work, a physical item of technology, as opposed to people and politics. Pre-existing parameters, as opposed to no predefined map. Resolved by parameter adjustment, as opposed to resolved by design according to the vision you have for your department. Technical work is diagnosis, whereas managerial work is analysis completely different way of thinking trying to change slide there it is so a technicians and managers think and work differently the promoted de technician needs to make that philosophy shift or he may remain remain stuck in this operative mentality or worse well two ways they can go wrong uh, one of them is that this uh, newly promoted technician decides that his job is now to have the um cushiest and most challenging and intellectually stimulating technical problems so leaves all the boring stuff for the for the other lowly technicians to deal with or worse they think they're the boss and that means they can order everybody else about uh, they don't understand uh, the the very nature of management in that the nature of management is that you are just another uh, member of the team but with a collective and overall helicopter responsibility rather than the rather than the responsibility for a given specific task and um, this is part of that mental leap um risk of no change in that mentality um you give, give a guy a more um, more salary and it doesn't turn into anything you get there's no um uh, no return on investment. The work group remains unmanaged. Nothing gets better. So processes and service outputs stagnate even further. Expectations of improvement are now not met. So, for example, there was supposed to be this new broom coming in, but it's not made any difference. And what about the those who were not promoted, especially if you're promoting this technician from inside a group that also contains people who consider themselves their peers, you promote one person there as a possibility of resentment from the ones who weren't promoted. The whole point about becoming a manager is that if you become a manager of a work group, the staff that you become man um, a manager of have to benefit from your, ma from your management status. They have to benefit from it. Okay, so um, they're both suited specific, uh, both brain types are suited to specific environments, but um, Beware of promoting technicians. It doesn't necessarily mean that managers will emerge. Um, I, I remember another consultancy project that I went into, and um, uh, I was doing um, a SWOT analysis of likely user opinions. And so I was doing lots of short interviews with various users. And I went to see one chap, and he said, Oh, so you're, you're working with, with IT at the moment? Yeah. Who, who in the IT department is sponsoring you? So I took out the organization chart of the IT department and put that organization chart in front of him to point to the person that I was dealing with. Before I could even do that, he said, look at them, 104 of them and not a single manager amongst them. It hit me like a brick. Um, um, has, has that always been the case? No, not really. But it's something that is part of the thing that prompted me to write the aspiring manager course. So defining manager then down this um, uh, this uh, y axis, I've got what they do and why they do it and how they do it and the philosophies and principles of whether they do it. And we start off with the technician who is doing fiddly technical stuff, various technical tasks at varying levels of complexity and reactive um, largely because a customer demands a solution or because they've been commissioned to take part of a project and or because it's in the technician's job description. Uh, the skills they will use are technical, diagnostic, and interpersonal, depending, uh, perhaps depending on the context. And they'll probably take a pride in the quality of the work or the or the elegance of the technical solution. And when you go to cross the team leader, now that team leader has a slightly different job. It, it probably is fiddly technical stuff in exactly the same way as it was when, and because he's still he's still a technician, just a team leader, a subject matter expert now, and um, his, the drivers of why there'll be natural leader confidence it's just the sort of thing that, he, that this particular team leader wants to do and delivers on behalf of the manager we've not come across the manager yet 
skills, leadership, strength of personality, um, notwithstanding the um, specializations of his um, subject matter expertise, and um, philosophies and expectation of performance from the person lower than him in the work group that he works for. Then you look at a supervisor and um, the, the supervisor's task is more kind of Sergeant Major-ish, um, making sure that the technicians do the prescribed fiddly technical stuff, making sure they do log on to the, um, to the ITSM system and do document solutions properly and making sure they do prioritize that, that prioritize their work properly. And um, they're, they're, they're making sure again that key performance targets are met. So their skill sets are going to be marshalling personal organization, thoroughness, and they'll probably take a, a pride in the completeness of that. And then we get to the manager, which is very different. You see, all the people are up to now, people have been following instructions. The manager was the one who decided and deigned who does what fiddly technical stuff to whom, how often and whether it's worth doing and telling the supervisor how to check that it's happening as it should. The understanding of the business needs of the work group are the drivers. In other words, the manager will take a, um, a, a broader perspective um, and a more distant horizon um, of, the, of the work they're doing and on a, on a much bigger scale and will determine what should happen in that department according to business needs. Um, their skill sets, again, will can be completely different. Perspective, investigative, objectivity, design, negotiation, and so on. And their principles are following their own vision for how things should be in order to meet a, a, an understanding of the business need. This, these are vastly, vastly different. And I think we've all here met, um, met team leaders who are still technicians, supervise, uh, or managers who only behave as, as supervisors, or managers who behave as team leaders. Management is not process. Process is a device to obviate the need for decision making. I mean, I, I am kind of casting a bit of a tilt here at um, at ITIL, um, which has historically been based on um, on processes, 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 and and some of these these things that they call um, that, uh, that are processes, they use the word management. So, like event management, incident management, release management, and so on. That's not management. It isn't. It's administration. The whole point of 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 management is or, or processes is that you design a process in order to get rid of the need to make a decision, in order to make sure that um, things pass normally through the routine. You, it, you, what you're trying to do in designing processes is to obviate the need for management. So you can't call event management management unless, of course, by event you mean. Um, um, an, an online staging of an event, um, but in, incident management is certainly not management. Incident management is a pro, is a process. It's um, and and if anything, what it needs is supervisory um, attention, not management. It's management is a, is frequently hyped, and and as a result, it just adds to the confusion. Management to me is the orchestration of resources to achieve an aggregate result, and those resources might include people, skills, processes, procedures policies time and so on and um and it's more incapable in keeping with historical definitions i mean management is an ancient ancient um um consideration rank in the organization it's uh, and the other thing is it's universal across industries um, it doesn't necessarily need to be technological looking at the um at the aspiring manager course itself it starts off with an introduction which puts puts the um, puts MISD and uh, an AMC into an industry and curriculum context, tells people how to go out and get the best out of the study, tells them what's going to be expected of their of their of their learning, gives basic philosophies, exam preparation. And then we have a quiz at the end of the module like we have at the end of most modules. In fact, the next module is thinking like a manager, perspective, skill sets, industry analogies, implications, the paradox of authority, you're, you're not the boss, mate, you're the manager, it's not the same thing. Um, and, and again, a progress quiz, introducing task management, essential terminology and structures. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, we have to introduce some new terminology because there's some terminology in the industry that's downright misleading. <coughs> An incident, for example, can mean this is something that um, 
needs to be be reacted to because a user has a problem, but it can also be um, uh, I'm um, I'm a hardware based disk monitor that's noticing some bad sex is appearing appearing in the RAID array and will and tell you that you will have to replace a disk in sometime in the next few weeks. They, those are completely different things, but it uses the same word. So what are we supposed to believe? And so that's why um, we need a more precise glossary for managing support than currently exists. Um, that's why we have to have things like, uh, we don't use the word incident in MISD. Um, um, we, we use um, uh, inquiries that, come, that become requests and these are prioritized a certain way. I could go into detail, but I haven't got the time, unfortunately. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, SLAs in context uh, in, in uh, once, sorry, we'll get into task management and then get into essential terminology and structures, making sure everything gets done, literally everything, not just the reactive stuff. If anything, um, this course will, will be the first um, um, where they've, um, we're gonna try to um, make the mentality less reactive, make it more uh, in control of the work workload rather than the workload being in, tr in control of the support group. Um, so making sure everything gets done, balancing projects to make sure they get done as well as the reactive stuff. True prioritization, because of course, um, in um, in ITSM, you've got, they use the word, this, this word priorities um, for classifying tickets and there are only four priorities. And if you've got 400 outstanding tickets, that's not prioritization. It's, uh, so we'll be looking at what the nature of prioritization actually is. Looking at the role of external support in all this, and again, a progress quiz, essential skills, customer service for technician. It's not about smiling while you're on the telephone, and um, it's, um, it, it's, it's rather more profound than that. People management and motivation, resource relationships, complaint handling, uh, developing staff skills, your own and your, and, um, and your people's, um, resource allocation, problem solving, negotiation techniques, and then a progress quiz and then finally you're working your working day which is essentially the managerial to-do list that i find so often that managers technical managers don't have they don't have a managerial to-do list they just react to whatever comes through the door instead of having a way of looking at their department as a factory and running it as a factory so a managerial to-do list with the beginning of the shift daily routine um, separating normality and exception, workload anticipation, future planning and, um, and close of play. And then finally, some final reminders, um, which is a list essentially of things that I've seen in one consultancy contract after another where technical managers fail. And there are some really common things. And then there's the exam, um, which is uh, 40 minutes, open book, um, 30 questions, multiple choice. Um, the method of delivery of, um, of AMC is um, it's, it was originally designed as a two day classroom course. And of course, then we all know what happened next. Um, so now we fully converted it to blended learning. There's a workbook that all students get issued with at uh, the, um, when, they, when they book the course. This workbook is substantial. There are 164 slides, 38,000 words, 212 pages which is why i would encourage you if you're sending somebody on this course book early they've got a lot of reading to do in a not very long amount of time and then the tutorial um, um first tutorial is a kind of one hour introduction to the course um i mentioned earlier on what that what that largely contains then we take a gap of a week for study then there's another tutorial of two and a half hours when we go through the materials, it, essentially it's a tutorial. I can't do chalk and talk of all that material in that time. So essentially what I'm doing is looking that the, uh, that the, uh, the students have grasped the concepts and, um, and can make use of those concepts. Then there's a two, a two week study gap. We finish off um, looking at the material and the students grasp of it in another two and a half hour meeting. And also, the examination takes place in that in that final tutorial. Throughout, um, I'm available by phone and email or, or, or video conference. 
if anybody gets stuck with the material and needs uh, needs some further guidance, some in, some um, on demand guidance, as it were. Um, um, and now I'm thinking I'm going to have to hand back to uh, to Adam because, um, uh, well, he's the guy who actually provides this course. Yeah, that's right. No, that's the right point. Thank you. Um, OK, so if, uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Thank you. I'll yep. come on to mine. Puts me back in control. There we go. Um, and I'm just going to rearrange those things on my screen. OK, there we go. Um, so thank you for that, Noel. Good uh, whistle-stop tour of, of the MISD curriculum itself. Uh, the, the reasons why it's different. I mean, one of the key uh, factors in, in CISOP onboarding uh, this qualification scheme is, is all about uh, the, the practical nature of the guidance. Um, there are, there's a lot of best practice uh, courses, curriculums, um, qualification schemes out there. Um, and a lot of them, they've got a lot of theory to cover. I do feel that this genuinely is a qualification scheme which, which, which goes on, which goes through the the how do we do things? How do we embrace the, the the challenges that we're faced with, and what can we do about those those challenges? Coming up with some real practical solutions. So, um, massive advocates of these. So, I do recommend not only the the aspiring manager course here, which we've been we're talking about today, but the operational manager, the foundation and operative training and the, and the strategy manager as well. So feel free to um, contact us for, for, for any information relating to, to any of those things. And you've got details of our websites uh, there on this slide for you to, uh, to go and browse and, and, and have a look at this information for yourselves. Um, just to sort of uh, finish off, today's session just uh, going to do a what next but I'm always just a bit conscious that we're always keen to hear of uh, the feedback from from these types of sessions as soon as we can um, so I'm, I'm going to post the, the link for our feedback form in the uh, in the chat window there so we either either take a look at that now or uh, or when when the session's finished but we do we do genuinely we, we consider ourselves to be a, a quality organization we've, we've been doing been around for a long time because we listen to the feedback from our students so if you have got any um, comments whether they're negative or positive about today's experience then please do do share us with share those with us in that uh, in that particular form so uh, thank you for that feedback is a gift as we say so uh, so we, we do definitely value that um, I will just point out that uh, one of the questions on there is all about whether you want to opt in to receive our marketing communications well uh, I know some people have a sort of natural uh, tendency to want to opt out of, of those things but just to sort of uh, iterate the point that it's it's sessions like today that uh, that we promote through those communications and if you do have enjoyed today and you do want to um, be, be made aware of, of future events which are similar to this then, then you need to opt in so that uh, so that you will continue to to receive those messages so hopefully you will you will do just that and we can continue talking to each other which is um, what, uh, what what doing business for me is is all about um, so it says what next so after aspiring manager uh, this this is really you know we, Obviously, we, we've probably got a mixture of people on this session today. Some who are perhaps connecting in to consider the aspiring manager qualification course for, for themselves uh, and those who are perhaps considering it for, for their team. Um, so we have a few courses aimed at different levels. Obviously, the aspiring manager is, is, is purely geared towards the, providing the support for those people promoted into a technical role um, to sort of help them with the managerial aspects that uh, that are related to that. Uh, the operational manager uh, course is is all geared towards those actually running a work group and, uh, and and taking on board managing a team and all the things related to that. Um, the foundation and operative is is a, a nice introductory course. Um, for, for, for anybody in IT really aimed at those sort of entry level staff that uh, that need that sort of uh, guidance on on how to, to provide a good service overall. Um, and then there's a the strategy manager qualification, which is obviously related to those people who are sort of defining strategy across the organisation. So senior leadership perhaps would be um, looking at, uh, at that because somebody has to be able to design the support service overall and and, and strategize the the the, the, the IT organisation in terms of how it best meets the needs of the business overall. So uh, I recommend that you look at all of those those options. 
In terms of the aspiring manager course itself, as as Noel mentioned, um, it's a blended learning approach. Um, so advice is to, to, to book early so that we can distribute the, the body of knowledge for you to uh, have plenty of time to prepare for each of the, the scheduled sessions, um, of which there are, there are three of those. And the next cohort actually begins on um, Friday the 10th of June, or rather the first introductory session is on the Friday the 10th of June. Obviously, we, we want you signed up um, or your colleagues signed up well in advance of that in order for them to re receive the, the body of knowledge. But uh, that's an introductory session on, on Friday the 10th of June. Moving on to the second session a week later on the 17th of June. Um, and there's a, a two week gap then before the uh, the final session, which actually includes the exam. Uh, now, the exam is administered online. So that all, all through those sessions, we, we will um, be able to see, observe you through the through the webcam, so that's an appropriate way for us to invigilate the exam as, as we go through that. So we'll distribute the uh, answer sheets and uh, uh, for you to print out, and we'll provide you with uh, a, a, the the exam paper on the day of the exam for you to go through and, and attempt those questions, and, and you send those back to 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 us for uh, for us to to mark them and uh, and, and and release your results. Uh, I think it takes up to, up to two weeks uh, from from what knows. Just he might correct me later on, but uh, uh, we, we we go through and make sure that we you, we've adequately assessed all of the questions and you've uh, you've achieved the correct score before providing you with your uh, your successful certificate, assuming that you that you are successful with that. Um, for those people who have connected onto the session today, and for, and for your colleagues, you'll see on the slide that this next cohort we're providing a, a discount up until the end of April. If you're able to book onto uh, book places onto this particular event, then um, you can get, do so with a reduced price. So I suggest that you you take advantage of that by replying to, to my email uh, that, I, that I send out um, later on today with uh, with with the, the recording and uh, copies of the slide and any more useful information that you may want to to consider overall. Um, so I'm happy to sort of just open up the the floor and uh, allow anybody to sort of come in with any questions. We've got relatively um, it's not a, a, a huge uh, attendance today. Um, so if anybody has any questions, feel free to to put them in the in the chat window or um, I'm, I'm, I think Noel and I can probably cope with you um, enabling your microphone and, and, and us hearing your voice if, if you like to do that. Um, I'm just going to sort of fill a little bit of time just whilst I give you the opportunity to to ask any of those questions. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask to, uh, one question to Noel just to sort of kick it off and, and see if uh, uh, if others have any after, after mine. Um, Noel, I'd just like to, to get your view on the, obviously, that these courses were intended to go down the route of classroom training originally. Um, as, as you mentioned, the pandemic hit and, and, and everything switched online. Um, but we, we've now decided between ourselves that th this is actually an optimal delivery of, of the course in this blended learning format. So can you just, from a student's point of view, just uh, demonstrate to them what the advantages of uh, of a blended learning approach as opposed to a classroom course? Well, well the, be the beauty of it is, of course, that you can um, you can do it in your own time. Um, we give you, a, well, if, you, if they book early enough and they get the book early enough, they can do as much study as they like before the course actually takes place. Then the introduction tells them how to how to focus on that, and the, a way they can go now for a week, and um, and 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 do their study at their own pace, at their own speed, and check with the tutor all the way through. You, you would just wouldn't get that on a classroom course, and apart from the fact um, we've kind of been forced by um, by circumstances to take the blended learning approach because now there are so many people studying this course all over the world. Um, uh, especially with the adoption by Avixa, that um, we, we've we've um, sharpened up the blended learning approach uh, so that it can provide much more than the uh, than the old classroom approach could have done. Yeah, I, I agree. I also think that um, sometimes when you do have a classroom course, which is sort of geared towards the, the full content being delivered across a two or three day period, um, often often I find that. Because of that, often the emphasis of the course is is purely to uh, not not well, it's purely to, to prepare the students to sit the exam, uh, as opposed to actually embracing the the knowledge and taking it on board. So from our point of view, 
we, we've sort of from the feedback that we've had from students who have um, participated in, in, in these courses is that uh, having the time to assimilate the information and, and 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 still have the opportunity to engage with an experienced tutor to, to ask any questions and and relate it to their organization is has, has been really valuable to them so um, yeah I, th I think it, it has worked out uh, particularly well um, can I deal with Sarah's question? Yeah, you can. I was going to say, Sarah, just the question: How many study hours do you expect to take during the self-learning sections? Okay, um, because of the nature of this course, people coming into it are um, of vastly different levels of, of 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 experience already. I've had managers who've been managers for five or more years attend this course just to refresh themselves. And we've also had newbies who've just been a technician for six months and have shown some kind of talent. So in other words, it's difficult to say. Um, I kind of, when I designed it, I was thinking of in terms of 10 to 16 hours of study over what would essentially be a, um, a four to five week period. Um, 10 to 16 hours should be should should do it. Um, I, I, we don't do a study of how much pe time people actually take. But one thing is notable is that um, uh, it's not often that people fail the exam. I think we've all, um, we only have a handful, a handful of failures and we allow for resets. So in other words, um, uh, if, if people don't can't grasp it at first bite, there are other bites at the cherry. But anyway, I mean, by and large, 10 to 16 hours should be able to service it for for most circumstances. Does that? deal with it sarah yeah i think so thank you noel um there's no other questions coming in uh, so what, what i'm going to suggest that we do uh, i'm just going to wrap up um say goodbye to you all i'll just uh, resubmit the, uh, the the satisfaction survey in there just in case you haven't had a had a chance to do that um but noel and i will we'll, we'll end the session but we'll, we'll stick around for a few minutes um to allow you all to sort of drop off and if anybody does have a, have a question then we'll We'll, uh, we'll we'll handle that as as we go through, um, but uh, yeah, th thank you all for for, for signing up and, and attending the event today. Uh, hopefully, you've you found it uh, useful, and, and and this particular course is something that you want to give some due consideration to. Uh, and extra special thanks to to Noel for for not only providing us with the uh, with, with the qualification scheme itself, but obviously his time today in uh, in, in taking us through the, the, this particular module. Um, and that's it. I think I think I'm done. Noel, any final comments? Uh, I think I'm done too, Adam. Yeah. Love them. Still be okay. around for a bit if people want to ask questions. Yeah, well, I'll say, well, just stick around for a, a few minutes. Just, I'm sure you'll, a few of you will disappear. I've seen a few thank yous uh, coming through, so uh, that's great. Okay, well, um, I look forward look forward to receiving my message and uh, my email after to, after this event. And any questions that you have as we go, then uh, please feel free to uh, to reply to me. Okay, so I wish you all farewell. Thank you for your attendance, and I'll uh, see you soon. Take care. Thank you.